Interestingly enough, that early American view, as, but it's as recent as 1952, <laughs> and the European view have now been overruled in modern First Amendment doctrine by what I will describe as the modern American view. And I think one of the interesting questions we'll debate in this room is whether if you had your druthers, you'd return us to the early American view or whether you see some wisdom to the modern view. The er, modern American view traces its roots to Oliver Wendell Holmes. Now, if you were in my class at Furman, you'd be saying, this doesn't seem right. I thought he said Holmes was the guy who invented the other view. Well, he's responsible for both. Because Holmes had a kind of conversion experience midway through his thinking on free speech law. In the early cases, Holmes adopted the bad tendency test and was responsible for sending many World War I protesters and recent emigres to the United States who were aligned with socialist causes and certain causes in Russia and Eastern Europe, he sent those people to the penitentiary. But he had a change of heart in a very famous case called Abrams versus the United States. And you can pinpoint Holmes's conversion to one word in his famous dissenting opinion in Abrams. It's the word but, B-U-T. <laughs> Go back and read, or you can Google it if you want, go back and read the central paragraph in his famous dissent in Abrams versus the United States. He opens that paragraph, which is arguably the most famous free speech paragraph ever written in the United States. He opens it with an articulation of the European view, of his early view. He opens it with the statement, the persecution of opinion seems to me perfectly natural. When you see speech you don't like, you naturally try to write it out of your society in law. You try to sweep away the opposition. It's a beautiful, powerful sentence. And that had been his earlier view. And then he says, but, I know you're not supposed to start a sentence with that, but he did. <laughs> he said, but, when men realize that time has upset many fighting faiths, and then he goes on to describe his very, very famous free speech test that said, you must tolerate even the speech that you loathe and believe fraught with death. The Holmes view lost. It lost while he was on the court. He never got any other justice other than Louis Brandeis to agree with him. So he and Brandeis dissented in a whole series of opinions. It lost in 1934 in Chaplinsky. It lost in 1954, in 1952 in Boherne versus Illinois. It began to prevail, however, at roughly the time that Buffalo Springfield put out the song that we all sang. It began to gain momentum in the late 1950s and then in a vengeance in the 1960s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. And it's as recent as last week's dog fighting opinion, an 8-1 opinion in the Supreme Court of the United States. And the modern view, which is characterized, and I'll end with this, characterized by, again, two hate speech cases, has forced our criminal law and our civil tort law to draw tight connections between evil speech and violence in the general marketplace. The first of those two hate speech cases is called Brandenburg versus Ohio. It is a Ku Klux Klan rally case involving a cross burning outside of Cincinnati. The Supreme Court of the United States held that the First Amendment protected the Klan's right to engage in virulent hate speech including cross burning as part of a Klan ritual, unless the state of Ohio could prove that the speech was directed to the incitement of imminent lawless action and likely to produce such action. A very difficult standard to me. A second hate speech case, also involving a cross burning, this one here in Virginia, 
was called Virginia versus Black. I should disclose that I argued the case in the Supreme Court. You may disagree with the position that I took. In Virginia versus Black, the court said, you may penalize threats and you may penalize cross burning when it is used as a threat. But the threat must be what the court described as a true threat. Two words that bear a lot of meaning in First Amendment doctrine. It is not enough that the speech be threatening in the sense that all of the hate speech that we've seen today is threatening to all of us, makes us angry, makes us feel distressed, makes us feel afraid. It's rather got to be threatening in the traditional common law sense something that you could punish under ordinary criminal law or tort law as, the as a threat in the sense of it placing a person in reasonable apprehension that some harm will come to them in a more immediate sense. And so the true threat doctrine and the incitement doctrine, although dealing with somewhat different areas, are aligned in their insistence that the speech be connected to the evil in some palpable sense. I also was involved in one other case involving a not as well developed branch of this law. I think that some of the statements that Rick made may have alluded to this. It's the use of aiding and abetting theory to punish hate speech that trains people to engage in evil activity. So you don't just say it would be a good idea to bomb this church. You give instructions on how you make the bomb. And there is, there is law, which I support, I was a litigant in, in favor of this doctrine, that allows the government or allows a civil litigant in tort to penalize that sort of aiding and abetting. I'm going to end by saying this. I find myself in the sometimes hard to understand or explain to my kids or my students or my colleagues on a faculty I find myself with very different sensibilities as I pass through these three realms that I've described. For better or for worse, I'm an advocate of the modern American view when it comes to criminal law and tort law. I actually think, for reasons we can maybe discuss, that we might be slightly safer allowing that speech to be out in the open as it is on the internet where we hope that there are FBI agents trying to infiltrate these folks and where the steam is being let off. But whether we are or not, I defend that series of doctrines that is unique in the world that protects freedom of speech unless you can show the nexus. Now I'm willing to work with prosecutors and I'm willing to work with tort litigants on when the nexus exists. And sometimes context can supply the immediacy or context can supply the threat because when you look at the whole picture, speech that may be wrapped up in a kind of innocent patina has a sinister undercurrent and you can prove it. But I think the government or the tort litigant has got to have that evidence and it's got to be the kind of thing that would both convince a jury and survive appellate review. But I'll tell you, I'm very different in realms one or two and two. As a parent, as a citizen, as an educator, I am an aggressive <coughs> condemner of hate speech in, in realm one. And I believe that in our membership associations, law firms, banks, voluntary private organizations, universities, we have the right and we have the tools to bring tremendous pressure to bear, including discharge from the university, if you will, to use my own example, when one goes beyond the graphic exposition of an idea, such as the bake sale that I described, to the kinds of destructive speech that my two colleagues have already discussed. Thanks for your attention, and I'm looking forward to our discussion.